Honorable John Bandi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, indeed, this is a historical moment. I think this is the first time that this country is facing the most realistic opportunity to uh, implement the first amendment to our 2010 constitution through a popular initiative. Some of these provisions, Mr. Speaker, when they were put in the constitution, we never knew that they would be put to practice. And I am seeing that we are likely to actualize and uh, implement Article 257 of the Constitution. But while seconding this motion, Mr. Speaker, allow me first to highlight the journey that we have taken so far. And as the saying goes, that a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a, root, a tree without its roots. Honorable members will recall, Mr. Speaker, that sometime in March 2018, I actually stood on the floor of this House to move a motion on the Building Bridges Initiative to a new Kenyan nation in support of the Unity Pact that had been uh, cemented on Friday 9th, March 2018, between our leader, uh, His Excellency Raila Odinga, and of course the President uh, Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. This extraordinary opportunity, Mr. Speaker, enabled Kenyans to face and address the challenges that have been facing Kenya, and openly and honestly discuss successes and failures, and finally, formulate the necessary corrective measures for the country to move forward. And this bill, Mr. Speaker, therefore, that we have before us today, uh, we shall be debating from today, uh, is actually a culmination of this process. And Mr. Speaker, in an effort aimed at sparing succe succeeding generations of Kenyans, the scourge of the deliberating cyclic electoral violence and forging national cohesion, uh, Mr. Speaker, His Excellency the President and the Right Honorable Raila Odinga, who are the foremost protagonists in the 2017 uh, presidential election, surprised all of us uh, by unveiling the now famous handshake on 9th March 2018. It is refreshing to note that the issues they wanted to be addressed that have continued to occupy the minds of Kenyans from that time to date, and which are being addressed through this process of building bridges initiative to a new Kenyan nation, include, but is not limited to the nine thematic agenda items, which I would just go through. One is ethnic antagonism and competition. The other one is lack of national ethos, inclusivity, devolution, divisive election, safety and security, of course, my pet topic of corruption, shared prosperity, and finally, the responsibilities and rights of Kenyans. The above issues, Mr. Speaker, were identified on the premise that when we end tribalism in this country, when we end corruption, when we end impunity and electoral theft or electoral fraud, and end nepotism and politically motivated development and employment. And Mr. Speaker, I want to clarify that politically motivated development and employment had taken and has continued to take root in this country. Remember, Mr. Speaker, there's a point in time that we came up with this say that siasambaya, my shambaya. We simply meant that if you are not pushing and supporting a particular political agenda, then you are not supposed to be entitled to development and your area was supposed to be excluded from development. Mr. Speaker, if these things are addressed, then it is um, expected that the glass ceiling will be broken for all Kenyans to realize their fullest potential, especially the historically marginalized, uh, namely women, youth, persons with disabilities, Minorities, which include the coast and the subas of the sh at the shores of Lake Victoria, pastoralists, majority of whom are in northern Kenya, and uh, the expansive Maasai land, the Samburus, the Pokots, Mr. Speaker, and other vulnerable groups like the Ogieks, the El Chamos, and others who would have a say in this country and should feel included in matters national development, both political and economic. Mr. Speaker, and I want to say that this will lead 
to forging a united, just and prosperous nation that we had envisaged when we forced the colonies to leave this country for Kenyans to govern themselves. Mr. Speaker, allow me to first briefly discuss what we have in mind when it comes to the above issues before I delve into the constitutional amendment bill itself. But I, I will not take much time on constitutional amendment bill because I think the mover has ably captured most of the areas out of the proposed amendment to the constitution. Mr. Speaker, the nine issues that have been addressed, I want to say that honorable members will appreciate that Kenya, first, I want to start with the national ethos, that Kenya lacks a sense of national ethos and is increasingly becoming a nation of distinct individuals instead of an individually distinct nation. Mr. Speaker, we tend to be thinking individualistic in ten, instead of thinking of our country as an, an individually distinct nation. There is therefore need, Mr. Speaker, for us to define and subscribe to a national ethos to foster unity, a sense of belonging, patriotism and pride. We need to take pride in our nation. We need to be patriotic to this nation. We need to have a sense of belonging to this nation. Long gone should be days when, when someone leaves a section of this country and moves to another section and says he's going to Kenya, as it happens, Mr. Speaker. We should feel that we all belong to this nation as a people. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, ethnic antagonism and competition is, are a major threat to Kenyan success and to the very continuity of our nation. Mr. Speaker, when, I want, when talking about inclusivity, I want to say that Kenyans have for a long time expressed a keen desire for greater political, economic, and religious inclusivity. In fact, inclusivity touches on those three distinct areas. We need religious inclusivity. Christians, Muslims, Hindus, even those who don't practice any faith should consider themselves as one nation. When it comes to political inclusivity, we want to see all Kenyans participating in political discourse in this country at the same level and people appointed to positions on merit regardless of which part of the country you come from. On economic inclusivity, I've just mentioned, Mr. Speaker, and members will agree with me that up to the advent of devolution, there are certain sections of this country which were receiving peanuts in form of resource allocation from the national government. But even still to date, you still find inordinate disparity in allocation of resources to various regions. Some regions, when they come to Nairobi, they say we are going to Kenya. As I've mentioned, the Northeastern, a lot of the session of paper number 10 marginalized and excluded a huge part of this nation, Mr. Speaker, from economic development. And that is something that the BBI bill is addressing and we need to follow it through with action. The mere presence of laws in our statute books will not help. We have to act. And Mr. Speaker, as a fundamental principle, Kenyans have a right to seek and be protected by the state and the law in, in pursuit of prosperity and happiness within our borders. And that you can read from our national anthem, Mr. Speaker. And that no Kenyan should ever be victimized or considered a foreigner in their own country, Mr. Speaker. During the constitutional process, making process, Mr. Speaker, which concluded in 2010, in our rush to adopt and mimic foreign models, particularly from the democratic West. Mr. Speaker, we forged a politics that is a contest of us versus them. And Mr. Speaker, we chose us and them on an ethnic basis. So anyone who does not belong to your ethnic grouping is them. Those who belong to your ethnic groupings become us. Even when they are not so useful, and helpful in our lives, they become us. Mr. Speaker, we need to ask ourselves whether this is helpful to the progress of this nation. And we have chosen, uh, and Mr. Speaker, I want to say that this has led and contributed to the divisive election 
that we have been facing in this country. We have associated progress in this country. We have associated development to who occupies the highest office in the land and the ethnic background of that particular individual. Hence, the, what we see after every election, the violence that is witnessed in this country is a manifestation of that us versus them principle which has not worked for this country and I dare say will not help this country even going forward. Because those of us who feel that those leaders who come from our area will make us progress realize when it is too late that that is not the case. That what you need is a leader who has the manifesto, who has the principle, a leader who has the vision, and a leader who can help bake the cake and help in promoting economic progress. Not a leader who leads us to economic ruin, like we have been seeing uh, happens in this country a number of times. Mr. Speaker, the most important matter facing Kenyans when it comes to shared prosperity, which is one of those items that I've listed above, Mr. Speaker, is generating sufficient jobs and employment, particularly for our young people. Kenyans are frustrated with the lack of sufficient and meaningful job opportunities, and much needs to be done to grow those sectors of our economy that would lead to high employment, promote and develop small business owners in the country in order to enhance self-employment. Mr. Speaker, these colleagues of mine will agree with me. How many abusive texts have we received, have we received from our unemployed youth who believe that we have a responsibility to give them jobs. Any time there is recruitment in the Kenya Defense Forces, Kenya Police, I receive a thousand texts in my phone asking for employment. When they don't get, I receive equal number of abusive texts, Mr. Speaker. And this is, you cannot fault these young men and women because they are frustrated. There are no jobs. They have gone to school, but they don't know what to do with their lives. And they expect us as leaders, policy makers, to come up with a solution. And if you don't get that solution, if you can't come up with that solution, in their own estimation, the net effect would be to insult you, to abuse you, call you names. And Mr. Speaker, with the social media, you will be surprised at what we see. Mr. Speaker, Furthermore, corruption as a principal threat to the existence and well-being of Kenya has undermined public trust in our institutions and shattered the hopes, dreams and aspirations of entire generations of Kenya. Mr. Speaker, what amuses me is with the, the ease with which Kenyans have decided to accept corruption as part of life. When you talk about corrupt leaders who should not ascend to certain positions in this country, the next thing you hear is everybody is a thief. I keep on telling them I'm not a thief. Why do you call all of us a thieves? If you are a thief, call yourself a thief. But don't call all of us thieves. And you find it is like it is very normal that when it comes to theft, you should not judge leaders on the basis of theft. And then when we, the leaders start stealing, Kenyans start complaining again. Kenyans must come out strongly and say it is wrong to put into positions of leadership thieves. And so they should act through their vote because that is the most powerful instrument that they have to correct and determine their future. And Mr. Speaker, that's why I'm happy that at least the BBI bill is proposing certain steps to be taken to handle issues of corruption, one of which is even trying to um, bring it clearly that these cases must be concluded within a period of time. Mrs. If we can conclude presidential elections in a short period of time, parliamentary elections, if we can put timelines, why can't we put timelines for corruption cases? So that those who are innocent can enjoy and continue with their life. But those who are corrupt and have stolen public funds should be taken to jail in a record time so that others are discouraged that it is very expensive and costly to engage in corrupt activities. Mr. Speaker, something that I want to talk about again is that this Constitutional Amendment Bill contains the results of a two-year process in which Kenyans from every walk of life in, all our, in almost all our counties 
across government entities and with a wide variety of expertise made their views known through the process. I will highlight proposed constitutional reforms as presented in the bill. It is important to appreciate that the process has been all-inclusive through public participation where views presented were analyzed and validated by Kenyans to initiate a constitutional amendment through or pursuant to the provisions of Article 257 of the Constitution. And Mr. Speaker, that is where I don't agree with those who are questioning the public participation in this bill. Because public participation, Mr. Speaker, this bill is a process of popular initiative. It is the people themselves. Over 4 million Kenyans appended their signature. Over 3 million were verified by the IBC as correct. And so, Mr. Speaker, this is a qu quite an in, in, uh, inclusive process. Mr. Speaker, when looking at Chapter 2 of the Constitution, on the bill proposes to seek to amend Chapter 2 of the Constitution on formative aspects of the Republic to ad address regional integration, cohesion, shared prosperity, and the centrality of the economy. This is in order to harness regional trade, investment, and people-to-people -people links to increase our prosperity, opportunities for investment, and enhance our security. Further, the bill seeks to amend Chapter 3 also on citizenship to strengthen the national ethos that I talked about and the responsibility of citizens. You know, if you look at the current constitution, Mr. Speaker, it talks about rights, 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 rights of individuals. But it is not addressing also responsibility. Rights comes with responsibility. You must also be responsible as a Kenyan. Mr. Speaker, the amendment is informed by the undertaking that the current constitution has uh, rightly imposed various socio-economic duties on the state, but does not envision, envision any responsibility on the part of the citizen. Mr. Speaker, the bill also seeks to amend the, the chapter 4 on the Bill of Rights to provide a constitutional appealing, underpinning for the privacy of citizens' personal data as an emerging area in human rights owing to significant technological developments in this area, the recent of which is the Oduma number and all the information that we are providing to the state needs to be protected. Of course, Chapter 6 is also, I mean, chapter six is also being amended on leadership and integrity to intensify the fight against corruption, as I mentioned earlier, by strengthening the relevant institution, and which includes a mechanism for more expeditious conduct of investigations, prosecution, and trial or of corruption-related matters. Mr. Speaker, further, the bill uh, seeks to amend Chapter 7 on representation of the people to, rem to remove issues of divisive elections arising from electoral processes, one of which is to enhance transparency and fairness of representation in the electoral system. Number two is to promote electoral competition based on ideas, values, and our shared humanity rather than the common enemy identity politics that have defined our electoral circle to date. Three is to promote gender equity in governance by actualizing the constitutional provision of the two-thirds gender principle, which has become illusionary all these years. We have attempted many times in this House, Mr. Speaker, to actualize the provisions of our constitution regarding the gender principles. Implement the provisions of Article 81 uh, D and 89.7 of the Constitution, which mandates that the electoral system is to comply with the universal principles of fair representation, equality of the vote, and the requirement that IBC, in setting constituency and ward boundaries, should progressively work towards ensuring that the number of inhabitants in each constituency and ward is as nearly as possible equal to the population quarter. I've had people fault the 70 constituencies, where the question is, when it, 20, by 2022, chances are that those constituencies which were protected, including Budalangi, Otai, and others, are supposed to be, as, as, are supposed to disappear. How then do you, all of a sudden, tell people who have been enjoying representation that henceforth those constituencies don't exist? At the same time, there are constituencies which feel that they are underrepresented in terms of the numerical and demographics. So you must balance all this, and it comes with a price, Mr. Speaker. Of course, the bill seeks to amend Chapter 8 of, on the legislature 
to remodel the parliamentary system by bringing the government back into the House, Mr. Speaker. This we have talked about. Previously, you will agree with me and members will agree that, Mr. Speaker, the current system is not very desirable for, this, for our society. We need government in this House to answer, to address, and to be accountable in this House to the people's representatives. And, Mr. Speaker, that is something that I want to encourage, that even if you don't see anything positive in this bill, you should see that as a positive step. On Chapter 9 of the ex Executive, of course, we'll be expanding Executive in order to promote greater inclusivity and mitigate the drawbacks of the winner-take-all electoral formula. However, Mr. Speaker, I've heard many people say that by creating the position of Prime Minister and the deputies, that you are expanding the government, you are making it very costly. That may be true, it may not be true, because you need to take the Constitution in its totality. As you create those extra positions, and there are three, we are also saying that members of the National Assembly can become ministers, and by that you will be reducing costs, because if, you, if the President nominates and appoints majority of members of the sitting members of the National Assembly into the Cabinet, Mr. Speaker, the net effect will be reducing the cost of maintaining those Cabinet Secretaries out there. And then we need to do away with this CASS, do away with this unnecessary PSS. We are appointing too many PSS like we almost attempted to do this afternoon. Mr. Speaker, we need to reduce cost at that level and have the position of Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. On the judiciary, I don't want to talk about it. The Ombudsman is supposed to enhance accountability to the people. As we protect the, the independence of the judiciary and the integrity of the judiciary, there is also need to call for accountability. The judiciary also needs to be accountable for some of their actions to the people of Kenya because the Constitution talks about the sovereignty of the people. It doesn't say judiciary is sovereign and others are not. People are sovereign and all organs, parliament, executive and judiciary, must be accountable to the people. The formula, a formula must be found. And if this is not the formula, then which is the formula? Mr. Speaker, as I, as I move towards concluding, the Bill 6 to amend Chapter 11 on the devolved government. Mr. Speaker, this has been talked about, and I know this is a very pet area for many of members of parliament. I will not delve into it. We all know that we are proposing to have uh, shareable revenue going to counties to in increase to 35 percent. Those of us who don't want to beg for money from the national government all the time, this is coming as a blessing to us, that now we will reduce the begging, money will be automatically allocated to our regions, whether your person is in power or not. On the public finance management, Mr. Speaker, there is a proposal to streamline the principles and processes to promote efficiency and ensure expenditures are directed to maximizing utility. The proposals give special attention to the actualization of the rights guaranteed under Article 43, as well as strengthening devolution. Finally, Mr. Speaker, the Bill seeks to amend Chapter 13, 14, and 15 to ensure that the public service, national security agencies, and commissions, and independent offices are not only strengthened but also are accountable to the people of Kenya, have internal accountability systems that clearly and transparently separate the power of appointment and promotion from that of interdiction and censure, and censure Mr. Speaker. We also, the proposal also helps in carrying out rigorous audits that, that uh, would inquire into value for money and ensure that sound principles of public finance management apply to every arm of government and every public institution. And finally, to facilitate, promote, and enable ethnic, eth ethical conduct and responsibility in public resource management. Mr. Speaker, make, uh, moving on, the biggest question that has arisen is the Parliament's role in processing. That is where I will end, Mr. Speaker. Our role in processing a popular initiative bill to amend the Constitution, whether it is merely perfunctory or ceremonial, uh, as the Dependent Committee on Justice and Legal Affairs has rightly observed, Parliament cannot replace the people's views on a popular initiative with its own. Thus, the ultimate authority regarding a popular initiative bill 
rests with the people. And that is the direction we should be driving this bill to. And Mr. Speaker, I spoke as the national chairman of Orange Democratic Movement Party, which is the minority party in this house. And Mr. Speaker indicated that as a party we have taken a decision on this matter, that the bill should be passed as is in its entirety, because Mr. Speaker, you cannot, in a process like this, a political process, you gain some, you lose some. You can never gain everything. You can never get everything you want. If you look at the report that, or the proposal that ODM presented to the task force and the validating team, Mr. Speaker, a lot of our views as a party were captured. And a number were also not put into the bill. And that is the game of politics. That is the game of negotiation. So, but Mr. Speaker, in a scale of 1 to 10, I would say that we are about 8 positive about this bill. And that is why the ODM party has given it, uh, has, 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 has said that this bill must be supported and we urge our supporters across the country, Mr. Speaker, to support this bill even at the referendum. Because that is where we are heading. I hope, Mr. Speaker, that the judiciary will dispense of the cases that are before them expeditiously so that Kenyans know the fate of BBI. We want to move forward. We want to finish with this matter, conclude it completely, and move to other things of national importance. Mr. Speaker, on the issue of unconstitutional constitutional amendments, in recognizing the constitution as the supreme law of the land and constitutionalism as a basic principle of respecting the sovereignty of the people, it therefore means that in amending the constitution and by having the people ratify it through the referendum, then you are actually creating a new order to be adhered to. Thus, the issue of unconstitutionalism should not arise, Mr. Speaker. I want to repeat, it should not arise. How can you call amendment to the constitution unconstitutional? It can never be. We can make mistakes. We can make amendments that are not good for this country. But it will be the constitution. The, the, it is the people of Kenya which, who created the 2010 constitution. It is them who can change it. Whether they are making it worse, it is them. It is their prerogative. You cannot again turn around and say that the people of Kenya don't know what they are doing. They are making unconstitutional amendment to the constitution. How can amendment to the constitution become unconstitutional? It can only be wrong. It can only be an amendment that does not help the country move forward. The committee has also pointed out in their report that a constitutional amendment becomes constitutional if it is approved by the people in a referendum. Therefore, powers of parliament on legislation notwithstanding, the BBI constitutional amendment bill should proceed as envisaged for the people to decide whether the amendments are constitutional or not, pursuant to provisions of, the, of Article 257, 10. If Kenyans feel that they don't want those provisions, they will reject them. But you cannot call what goes to the people of Kenya unconstitutional. Mr. Speaker, the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020, including its schedules, is one bill and has provisions contemplated under Article 225, where a referendum will be required. What we don't want to hear is that this bill can be signed into law without going to a referendum. That cannot happen. There are provisions in this bill, and it is one bill. It is one bill. This bill must go to the people of Kenya for validation. Mr. Speaker, in this regard, I urge this House to approve the bill, a decision that will enable the document to be subjected to a referendum as one bill. And I want to repeat, the people of Kenya will decide on the Constitutional Amendment Bill 2010 as one bill. There cannot be multiple bills in one bill. It is one bill, and Mr. Speaker, with those many remarks, I beg to second. Thank you.